Better than that. Good evening, everyone. Evening. Now I feel welcome. How are you? Did you have a good day? Good. Did anyone have a particularly hard day? May I see your hand? You had a particularly, okay, my good brother, but the Lord brought you through, and you are here. If we don't have hard days or challenges, we would not feel the need for God. Are you with me? If there were no Red Sea, there would be no miracle. If there were no hunger, there would be no manna. If there were no thirst, there would be no water from a rock. So when these trials and tribulations come our way, take them as opportunities to pray and to agonize with God. I welcome you this evening, and I also welcome those who are listening and watching via the Internet, wherever you are. May God bless you, and may the living words that you hear change your life in the direction of heaven. Who is with us tonight for the very first time? May I see your hand? First time. Anyone? God bless you. God bless you. Anyone else first time? That light is in my eye. Now I can see you if I do that. Okay, there you are. Well, thank you very much for coming. We're delighted you've come. Brother Holder, nice to see you as always. You know, the Bible says, He that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. And you are enduring unto the end. So thank you, Brother Holder for coming again. May God bless you, and I mean that from my heart. Before we begin, do three little favors for me. Favor number one, have you already turned off your cell phones? Who has not done it? Please raise your rebellious hand. All right, you may turn off your cell phone now. This is my brother, Brother Ted from Nairobi. He has repented, and he's making wrong things right. All right, anyone else has not yet turned off a cell phone, please do that and God will be pleased. Favor number two. What, what's favor number two? And what will you say? Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. And favor number three, what's that? Think. Yes, we want you to think. Let us pray now. Holy Father in heaven, I come to you in the name of Jesus, your Son, and our Savior, to ask you today, God, to look into our hearts. And if there is anything resident within us that is unlike you, Father, we give you 100% permission to remove it by the blood of Christ, to grant us your spirit, Father, that the spirit may guide us and lead us tonight as we study the truth. I humble myself in your presence and ask only, Father, that you would use me, that your name may be glorified and your people blessed. Speak through me, I pray. Bless not only those of us gathered in this building, but all your children watching by the internet, wherever they are, Bless them in a very signal and special way. In Jesus' name we pray. Let all God's people say amen. amen and amen. Our subject for this evening, deeper and higher. What did I say? Deeper and higher. In Genesis chapter 12, reading from verse 1. Genesis 12, reading from verse 1. Let's go there with me. I'll try to release you by 8.15 if I possibly can. But always bear in mind, we have until 8.45. But I will not, I will do everything in my power every evening to release you before 8.45 because I know you have to work tomorrow. Genesis 12, reading from verse 1. The Bible says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now we have God announcing the two responses he has for people. One, he either blesses or he curses. There's heaven or hell. You are a sheep or you are a goat. You are wheat or you are tear. You are lost or you are saved. Jesus says, if you're not for me, you're against me. What I'm trying to get into your minds is that the Bible does not have a middle ground. When it comes to opposition regarding God and his requirements of us. And so God tells Abraham, I will Bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. 
Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 30. We shall read verse 19. Deuteronomy 30, reading verse 19. Our subject is deeper and higher. Deuteronomy is book number five. Most of it written by Moses, but clearly the chapter that records the death of Moses could not have been written by Moses, probably written by Joshua to complete the book. Do you have chapter 30 of Deuteronomy? Verse 19, listen to these words. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, says God, Choose what? Life, that both thou and thy seed may live. Now, the choice of life or the, is, is the choice of blessing is a choice of life. And life affects not only those who choose, but generations that follow, that both thou and thy seed. Listen to the words again. I call heaven and earth, and there's no other place. With all respect to those who believe in purgatory, the Bible identifies heaven and earth, and that's it. Amen. Jesus said in Matthew 28, 18, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. There is no other place, because wherever there's a place, Christ has power, and he identifies to heaven and earth. And so God tells the Israelites, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life death, blessing, and curses. God says, choose life. Now, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 11. We'll read from verse 26 of Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 26. Our subject is deeper and higher. Behold, I set before you this day, what? A blessing and a curse. That's all God ever sets before us. Now, the blessing includes life. The blessing includes health. The blessing includes wealth. The blessing includes strong families. The blessing includes all sorts of things. But it, one heading is just blessing. I have set before you this day a blessing and a curse. Now, everything that comes on the blessing has a condition. Verse 27, read with me. A blessing if what? If you obey what? The commandments which I command you this day. And a curse. If what? You will not obey the commandments. We have a blessing and a curse. And the condition for the blessing is obedience to God's commands. Now, who said that? It was Christ. I told you before, the God of the Old Testament is Christ. And I gave you Bible evidence. There's one evidence I didn't give you. Let me give it to you now. If you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, reading from verse 7, Neither be idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and play, and rose, eat and drink, and rose up to play. Verse 8, neither be, um, commit fornication, as some of them also committed, and were destroyed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Verse 9, neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Now, if you're thinking, favor 3, Paul is saying, when the Israelites were bitten by snakes, and it's recorded in Numbers 21, verse 6 and 7, verses 6 and 7, they had angered whom? Come on, answer me. They had angered whom? Christ. So when you read Numbers 21, verse 6, and the Lord sent fiery serpents among the Israelites, and the serpents bit the Israelites, and many of the, the people died, it was Christ. So it is Jesus Christ. He wasn't called Christ back then, the second member of the Godhead. He said, I have set before you a blessing and a curse. Now we're told of Jesus Christ in Hebrews 13 verse 8. Jesus Christ, what? The same yesterday, today, and forever. What he set before the Israelites 3,500 years ago, he sets before us today blessing and a curse. 
The condition for the blessing is obedience. The condition for the curse is disobedience. Now, obedience and disobedience refers to our relationship to God's law. Either way, the law is central. To obey God, you keep the law. To disobey God, you disobey the law. I have set before you a blessing and a curse. Now, let's go to Deuteronomy 6, verse 25. Our subject is deeper and higher. Deuteronomy 6, verse 25. And if the Lord convicts me, I'll tell you something about Deuteronomy that will really open your eyes. It depends on how the Lord leads me and the servants he puts on my mind. Deuteronomy 6, 25, do you have that? If you have the King James Version, read with me. The Bible says, and what? It shall be our righteousness. Stop. What's the subject of that verse? Righteousness. Here's the condition. Keep reading. If we do what? Observe to do what? All these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. What is righteousness? Obedience to God's law. <laughs> Listen to Christ again speaking through Moses. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. Who spoke the Ten Commandments from Mount Sinai? Jesus Christ. The same person who died on Calvary. Now, if you keep this in mind, you go back to Deuteronomy eleven twenty six. 26. Behold, I have set before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing, verse 27, if what? If ye obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day. Now, when you keep the commandments, what kind of life are you living? According to verse 25 of chapter 6, a righteous life. Listen to me carefully. Righteousness is conformity with the law of God. Let's run over to the New Testament, but not run away from Jesus. We're running to Christ. Where we haven't left him, we're with him. Now he's in human form, and he is speaking the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, reading from verse 17. Our subject is deeper and higher. Matthew 5, reading from verse 17. Do you have that? Not yet? All right. I'll give you 10 seconds to find it because time flies very quickly when you're preaching. You don't believe me? Ask any preacher. Do you have Matthew 5, 17? Jesus says, think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am not come to destroy what? But to fulfill. Let's go back to verse 17. At the beginning of that verse, Jesus tells us there's some things we should not even think. One of them is that there's no law. Uh, you missed the profundity of the statement. You miss it completely. What is it that affects behavior? Our thoughts. It is thinking that gives character to behavior. To behave in an anti-law way, you must think in an anti-law way. Are you with me? Jesus says, don't even think. There's some things we should not allow to enter our heads. Because once they enter the head, you can't evict them. You have to now exercise power to control the effect. Once, by the way, those of you with children, remember that. If you don't monitor what they watch on television, and who they hang out with, and what they read, and what video games they play, once it enters their heads, you nor anyone else cannot get it out. And everything in the head affects the outward expression, affects our behavior, affects our speech. And so Jesus says, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. One of the missions of Jesus Christ was to fulfill the law. The word fulfill, just switch the two syllables, is to fill full, as I heard someone say a long time ago. 
Verse 18, read with me. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Will heaven and earth pass away? Forever? Will there be a new heaven and a new earth? So will we always have heaven and earth? Yes. <laughs> we will always have heaven and earth. Because heaven and earth is everywhere. Oh, you keep missing what I'm saying tonight. You must not have had lunch. <laughs> Listen to me again. Heaven and earth refers in the Bible to everywhere. Are you with me? Jesus says, as long as there's heaven and earth, my law will be in force. Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law. If a jot passes from the law, a jot has passed from the character of Christ and God because the law expresses the righteousness of Christ. Verse 19, whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so. There are preachers in pulpits who teach people to break the commandments. And some of those preachers occupy Adventist pulpits. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Let me explain that. It does not mean he will be in the kingdom and call least. He'll be outside of the kingdom, but those in the kingdom will call him the least among those who destroyed. He cannot be in the kingdom. Are you with me? No, you're not with me. We're having this battle every night. I answer you. You say you're with me, I say no. And you always let me win. Are you with me? Let me say it again. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Means those in the kingdom will call that person least. But that person will not be in the kingdom. Because the Bible is clear. Blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. To break them. And to teach people to break them is to qualify yourself supremely for the hottest parts of hell. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. If you are great because you keep God's law, you are in the city safe and secure. For I say unto you, verse 20. Now you read verse 20 with me. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now we need to look at that statement. Who is speaking? Jesus Christ. Who spoke the commandments from Sinai? Jesus Christ. Who said I set before you a blessing and a curse? Who said the condition for the blessing was obedience? Who said the condition for being cursed was disobedience? This is Jesus Christ. Christ. Listen to what he said. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall be deeper and higher than the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case. What does he mean by in no case? There's no way. There's no how. Then we must understand what it means to have a deeper and a higher righteousness. Is that not an intelligent question? What does Jesus mean by a righteousness that's deeper and higher? Because he said, if you don't have that, you're lost. Let's go to verse 21 of Matthew 5. Ye have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, or it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not kill. But I say unto you, and whoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. 
And whosoever shall say it is brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. And whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hellfire. Now, what is Jesus doing? He takes one of the Ten Commandments. Which one? Commandment seven or eight? Is six. <laughs> I told you you're not with me. I'm sorry to embarrass you on the internet, but you're not with me. Jesus said, ye have heard that it was said by them of all time, thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother, without a cause, shall be in danger of the judgment. Now, do you realize what Christ is doing? Try to connect verse 20 with verse 21. Repetition is an effective tool of teaching. Let's repeat verse 20. For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case. Now in verse 21, what is Christ doing? He is giving them an example of what? Deeper and higher righteousness and an example of shallow righteousness. Let's identify the two. Ye have heard that it was said by them of all time, thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. You've heard that, says Christ. But I say unto you, what Christ meant by the first part was you have heard that you shouldn't kill somebody physically. Are you with me now? Don't shoot people. Don't cut their heads off. That's what you've heard, and you've all done that. But I say unto you, there is a deeper application of that commandment, which is an example of righteousness that exceeds whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say, Raka, shall be in danger of the council, and whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Jesus now associates unreasonable anger with murder. So that for Christ, your attitude can be murderous. Now, Christ says to you and to me, because those people 2,000 years ago are dead. He is talking to us. Do not have a murderous attitude towards people. You know, there's some people who are angry with people for years. You're either angry with your father, or you're angry with your mother, or you're angry with your ex-wife. You're angry with... The people just angry with the Democrats, angry with the Republicans, angry with the Japanese, angry with themselves. Christ equates anger with murder. Now let me ask you this easy quiz question. Before I ask you the question, let's look at Christ giving another example. Verse 27 of Matthew 5, our subject is what? Deeper and higher. Verse 27, Matthew 5, Ye have heard that it was said by them of all time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, Whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Now Christ is saying, You have heard that there's a shallow uh, understanding of commandment 7. As long as you do nothing physically, then there's no, uh, you're, you're, you're fine. Jesus says that's not true. The level of righteousness I want in my people is the righteousness that says your very mindset can be adulterous. Deeper and higher. Now, I said, based on Deuteronomy 6.25, not I, the Bible, and this shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. Now, Jesus tells us how to do these commandments at a depth and a height that represents a righteousness that exceeds 
Here's how you keep commandment seven. Don't lust. You may never enter someone's bedroom, sneak into someone's house. Mm -mm. Christ says, no, 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 that's too up. Don't even lust. Whosoever looketh on a woman. Let me bring a few observations regarding that statement. He doesn't say, read the verse for me, verse 27 of Matthew 5. What does Christ say? Whosoever looketh on a woman. Is that what he says? No, read it. Is that what he says? But I say unto you, keep reading, what? Whosoever. Does he say, if any man looks on a woman? What does the verse say? Whosoever. If you're a woman lusting after a woman, <laughs> does that happen? Are you shy? Do women marry women in the United States? Whosoever. Woman looks on woman. Man looks on woman. Man looks on man. Do men marry men in the United States? Yes. yes. Any human being who lusts after another human being, you've committed adultery in God's eyes. And while no one can be jailed on the earth for lusting, you are jailed in the heavenly courts. Now, I went back to Deuteronomy 6.25 to make this connection. The verse says, and it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded us. Now, so righteousness is associated with obedience to God's law. Jesus Christ now says, deep righteousness. Are you with me? Righteousness that exceeds, he defines it by going to the law. So when Jesus said in verse 20 of Matthew 5, for I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Someone might have said, how? Give me an example. Christ says, go to the law. Look at commandment 6, thou shalt not kill. Look at commandment 7. He just needed to use one to refer to all the others. Are you following me? He just needed to use one. What am I trying to say to you, my brothers and sisters? This church has been raised up by God to show the connection between Christ and his law. Do you know why the world is in the trouble it is in? God's law has been disregarded. And when God told Moses to tell the Israelites, Behold, I have set before you this day a blessing and a curse, a blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day, a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God. But go aside out of the way which I command you this day to, for, to, to follow other gods which ye have not known. The reason why the world is in the condition it is in because the law of God has been disregarded. And so God raised up a people to remind the world that God has a law. And that law must be kept. Not superficially. It must be kept at a level that produces a character that fits you for heaven. When Jesus said, ye have heard it hath been said, thou shalt not kill. That level of obedience fits you for hell. You missed it. Uh, don't argue, you missed it. <laughs> Do I rebuke you too often? <laughs> Listen to me carefully. Ye have heard that it was said by them of all time, thou shalt not kill, meaning don't kill physically. What I'm saying to you and to myself, if that's the level at which we keep that commandment, we are headed straight for hell. Are you with me? Verse 27, ye have heard that it was said by them of all time, thou shalt not commit adultery. Jesus is saying, if that's the level at which you keep that commandment, just no physical contact, you are headed for hell. Because the commandment was not given to control behavior first. It was given to transform and control what? The heart. Are you with me? 
Now Jesus says in Matthew 12, 34, O oh, generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things for out of the abundance of the heart? Christ did not die to change my fist. So I would stop punching people in the nose. Christ did not die to change my feet so I'd stop kicking people. Christ died to change my heart. Are you with me? When the heart is changed, everything else falls in line with the heart, which is the mind. Verse 35 of Matthew 12, Jesus says, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth what? Good things. That's all he can bring. A good heart can only produce good things. Jesus said in Matthew 7, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. I don't want to say you're not following me. I won't say that again. But I will say you look lost. Listen again. The Bible is so, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. The condition of the heart determines the character of the action. And so we read in Christ's Object Lessons, page 316, paragraph 2, every act is judged by the motive that prompts it, or the motives that prompt it. Counsel to Parent uh, Child Guidance, page 201, paragraph 3. Every course of action has a twofold character and importance. It is either virtuous or vicious, right or wrong, according to the motive which prompts it. And so what Christ desires to change is the heart, the source of our thinking, the source of our motives, the source of our intents. That is why, under the New Covenant, he writes the law where? On our hearts, not our fists. Because if the law is in the heart, what comes out? Because that's what the law is. Psalm 119 verse 172, all thy commandments are righteousness. God puts it in the heart. He writes it because you and I can't. And so Jesus says to us in Matthew 5 verse 20, for I say unto you, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of God. Why is righteousness required for that kingdom? Because that's all we will find in the kingdom. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 13, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and new earth. Who can finish that verse? Wherein dwelleth righteousness. That's all you'll find. And not superficial righteousness. Deep, profound righteousness that is deeper and higher. The kind that Christ requires now. Let me say it again. I'll say it this way. Ellen White writes somewhere, I don't recall where. Our last day on earth is the same as our first day in heaven. What she means is, the character we have when Christ comes is a character we walk into the kingdom with. It doesn't change. Let me say it this way, we must have the character fit for heaven now before we get to heaven physically. If you want to pass a test in physics, you don't learn the subject during the test time. You study it before, are you with me? Then you take the test. My brothers and sisters, what I'm trying to tell you tonight, we must take a second look at the standards that can control our lives. A lot of people follow the Ten Commandments at the level that Christ is not impressed with. The level which says, ye have heard, it hath been said at that level. So all of us can say, I have never killed anyone. I have a clean rap sheet with the police. But how many people have I discouraged by my attitude? How many people have left the church because of my, the way I treated them? 
How many people have had their hopes and their ambitions crushed because of the things I kept saying? And they lost all confidence in the blessed abilities God has given to them. We kill people. And Jesus says, that's murder. What I'm saying to you is, as children of God, as Christians, as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we must live at a level that is above where the ordinary person lives. Christ required it 2,000 years ago. He required it even before then. He requires it now because Christ has never had two standards. Let me put it more bluntly. When God made Adam and Eve, they were sinless. That's what Christ requires now. God requires at this time just what he required of the holy pair in Eden, perfect obedience to his requirements. Faith and Works, page 52, paragraph 1. Let me say it again. God requires at this time just what he required of the holy pair in Eden. Who are the holy pair? Adam and Eve. In what condition? In this sinless condition. And what he required was perfect obedience to his requirements. His law remains the same in all ages. The great standard of righteousness presented in the Old Testament is not lowered in the New. Now catch these words. It is not the work of the gospel to weaken the claims of God's holy law, but to bring men up where they can keep its precepts. Let me say that again. Remember my sermon on the law of life? I said that Christ was the one who set up a world based on commands and law. Were you here? The gospel is Christ's way and the Father's way of restoring us to fit into that system. You see, notice when we sin or man sin, God didn't change the law. He set up a system to change us. Uh, come on, tell me you're with me for once. Let me say it again. Listen to 1 John chapter 3, verse 5. And you know, well, let's read verse 4 first. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is a transgression of the law, verse 5. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, not the law. Listen to me carefully. When Adam sinned, he broke the law. Now, God had a choice. Okay, let's see. I can keep Adam from sinning anymore by destroying the law. Or I can keep Adam from destroying the law by giving him a law-abiding heart. And the way God gives us a law-abiding heart is called the gospel. Let me present another way. Education, page 15, paragraph 2. To restore in man the image of his maker. To bring him back to the perfection in which he was created. Listen to the words again. To bring him back to the perfection in which he was created, to promote the development of body, mind, and soul, that the divine purpose in his creation might be realized. This was to be the work of redemption. This is the object of education. The great object of life is that Christ should bring us back to the way it was before sin. And when you go back to the way it was before sin, you few thou shalt not kill differently. Are you with me? And Jesus says to us, accept your righteousness the way you view the law. And the law itself is righteousness. Shall exceed deeper and higher. He shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. And all of us want to enter that kingdom. What shall we ask God to do tonight? Father, give me a heart that wants to do your will. Give me the mind Jesus had. And so Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 says, or from verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became what? And became what? Obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. To have the mind of Christ 
is to have a mind that's prepared to do whatever God says. That's the righteousness that Christ requires. Because the mind required to enter God's kingdom is the same mind that Jesus had. And let me tell you this, it's not pleasant. The mind of a sinner is the mind of Satan. Let me say it differently. There is no conflict between Satan and a sinner. They have the same mind. Now, Satan has more power to express his than the sinner has. But the mind is the same. We have evidence to point, that points to that. What's the punishment for Satan? What's the punishment for sinners? How will Satan meet his death? How will he meet his death? How will sinners meet their death? Fire. Why? The same punishment? The same crime. Same mind. Now, the Bible is a book of opposites. If the same mind, the mind of the sinner, is the mind of Satan, they get the same punishment. Then, to live where Jesus lives, we need the mind of Jesus. We can never be as righteous as Christ, but we want to be in the same mold as Christ. My brothers and sisters, accept your righteousness and mine shall exceed. Deeper and higher, you and I shall in no case enter into the kingdom of God. That was said by Jesus. And since Jesus came to save that which was lost, we go to him for that mind. And the only way to get the mind of Christ is to have Christ. Let me clear that up quickly, then I'll close. Some people think, you go to Christ, get eternal life, you thank him, and you walk away. Eternal life is Christ. Amen. First John 5, 11, and this is the record that God hath given to us, eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Verse 12, he that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. What did Jesus tell Martha? I am the resurrection and the life. Because I live, ye shall live also. Tonight, ask Christ to give us his mind. And he gives us his mind by giving us himself. And since he's still in human form, despite the fact he's also God, he gives us himself by giving us what? His spirit. Because the spirit of Christ, the, spirit, the Holy Spirit is both the spirit of God and the spirit of Christ. So Romans 8 verse 7 says... <clears throat> Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So that they that are in the flesh, verse 8, cannot please God. Verse 9, but we are not in the flesh. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man hath not the Spirit of Christ, he's now this. The Spirit is called two things in that verse. The Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of God. When the Spirit comes to us, we have the Spirit, we have Christ, and we have God. Are those all the amends I get for that? <laughs> I want us to make, ask God tonight, Father, give me the mind of Christ, a mind that loves to do right. How did the Father describe Jesus Christ in uh, Hebrews 1 verse 9? Thou hast loved what? Righteousness. What is righteousness? Conformity with God's law. What it was that Jesus loved according to the Father's testimony? You love conformity to the law. And you hate iniquity. What's iniquity? Sin. Going against God's law. So when we talk about righteousness by faith, we can virtually say right doing by faith. And it's only by faith. And faith is not a feeling. Faith is total trust in the word of God. And the only way to trust God's word is to do what it says by the power of the author. And the author is the spirit of Christ. So tonight, I want God to rewrite his law in my heart. I want to obey the commandments the way Jesus says, at a deeper and a higher level. How many of you will say, Father, give me that righteous mind of Jesus Christ. May I see your right hand? Don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid. Stand up. Let's pray. 
and bring an end to deeper and higher. And the, uh, the appeals that we make are also for those listening online. Ask God to give you the righteous mind of Christ. Christ loves obedience. He hates disobedience. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for Christ. We thank you for what he said in Matthew 5, 20 and onward. We thank you, Father, it was Christ who spoke the commandments from Sinai. It was he who said, I've set before you a blessing and a curse, a blessing if you obey, a curse if you disobey. The language is so clear. And the power to obey at that level is the power of Christ himself. Because that deeper level of righteousness is not possible in human power. Only through the indwelling of Christ, through his spirit. And so, Father, our prayer to you tonight is give us the righteous mind of Christ that we may obey you from the heart in love. Bless everyone who came tonight. Take us home safely. Bless your people listening by the internet, Father. And as we disperse, let us dwell and meditate on what we've heard tonight. Bring us back tomorrow night, dear God, to listen to the words you will give to your manservant. We offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Let all God's people say Amen and amen. God bless you. Travel safely. Keep the speed limit. And we will see you tomorrow night.